You know, whenever I read the Bhagavad Gita, especially commentaries upon it, explanations, there are different um, approaches to it. Some say the central teaching of the Gita is uh, uh, bhakti, devotion. Some say the central teaching of the Gita is action. Uh, Sri Krishna relentlessly urges Arjuna into action. In, some say it is duty. Another uh, way of um, looking at the Bhagavad Gita is that it is a manual on spiritual life with uh, teachings about God and avatara and meditation and so on. All of which no doubt are true. But if you actually look at the Bhagavad Gita itself, when Sri Krishna starts teaching Arjuna, the first thing he teaches Arjuna is probably the central message of Vedanta. I'm saying it very carefully, central message of Vedanta. I did not say central message of Gita, because the central message of Gita and the central message of Vedanta are one and the same. They are, the Gita is part of Vedanta. Gita in itself may have a unique approach to it. There may be something special in the Gita over and above the general message of Vedanta. But first of all, we must appreciate the central teaching, the general message of Vedanta. And that is, without any doubt, the teaching on the Atman. That is our subject this morning. You might think, Atman, who or what is that? It's you. It's our real nature, what we are. If you notice what Sri Krishna starts off with, after, in the second chapter, after Arjuna has finished his lamentations and his questions and his doubts, Sri Krishna starts off by teaching Arjuna the doctrine of the Atman, uh, what we really are, not what we think of ourselves, but what we really are. And this is the central teaching of Vedanta, that if we would really know ourselves as we truly are, Atman means the self, the essence, the self, of what we truly are. If we know that, who am I or what am I? then all our problems would actually be solved. All the rest, God, the teachings about God, the teachings about the creation of the universe, the teachings about incarnation, uh, avatara, the teachings about bhakti and jnana, love and devotion and knowledge, the teachings about meditation, teachings about action, karma, all of them come afterwards. Chronologically in the Gita also, you see that they come afterwards. The first teaching, the very first teaching from approximately the 11th verse where Sri Krishna starts speaking, starts teaching Arjuna, to about the 25th verse of the second chapter, is a concentrated teaching on the Vedantic doctrine of the Atman. The answer to the question, who am I? Or more precisely, what am I? Because who am I? Um, it can lead to a different kind of uh, thinking. Um, especially in our world today, in this country, who am I would, would mean that am I, am I born to be a musician, or am I an artist, or am I a good person, or a bad person? These are questions related to the personality, the mind, uh, our dispositions. But beyond that, there is an essential nature to ourselves, a spiritual nature, deeper than that, deeper than the person. That's what the Atman is. The, the teaching about the Atman is the real nature beyond the differing personalities which we are. What does Sri Krishna say? The first thing which he says, and he repeats it again and again, um, is that the Atman is beyond death. A simple statement, but a very powerful statement. The essential teaching of any kind, not only Vedanta, any kind of spirituality, in any religion, in all the religions, is this conquest of death, transcendence of death. If death of the body is the end of us, there's nothing more left over, then there's no religion actually. That's the end of religion. There can be no point to any kind of religion if there is no, no existence after death. So this transcendence of death, that is the first teaching about the Atman which Sri Krishna gives. Um, Swami Vivekananda, 
when he came to this country more than 100 years ago, one way he would, one of the verses he loved quoting, um, chanting the original Sanskrit and then translating for the benefit of his audiences here in the United States was this, the immortality of the Atman. It goes like this. It's, it's a very famous uh, mantra from the Upanishads. Um, Shrinvantu Vishwe Amritasya Putraha Aye Dhamani Divyani Tastu Vedaham Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varnam Tamasa Parastat Tameva Viditva Ati Mrityumeti Nanya Pantha Vidyate Ayanaya. Beautiful verse. What does it mean? Shrinvantu Vishwe Amritasya Putraha Listen, ye children of immortal bliss. The very first line is striking. We think of ourselves, the first truth that we think of ourselves is that we are mortal. We are fated to die. Theists and atheists, people who are uh, believers and non-believers, everybody dies. All those who have, we have known in the past, grandparents and parents, maybe they are dead. And all are passing out of this world and so will we one day. So death is the first, is the fundamental truth. We don't, we don't like dwelling upon it. It's an unpleasant truth to dwell upon, but it's a truth nobody can deny. In fact, I mentioned this book earlier, The Denial of Death, Ernst Becker, who won a Pulitzer Prize for it. He got the prize, I think, just before he died. <laughs> okay, M morbid, morbid humor, but... <laughs> No, it, it's very touching. Actually, uh, he was interviewed by a very well-known journalist from the Science Magazine or something. He was already on his deathbed, and he talked about the denial of death, why, how we tend to resist this idea that we are going to die. And it, it's a pretty morbid book. I mean, I'm, I'm not recommending it as reading, but it's pretty deep also. It shows that most of the things which we do in life, he calls them immortality projects including religion, um, children, grandchildren, founding companies, businesses, uh, writing books, including the denial of death, and, and so and so forth. All of these activities, charities, all of these activities are basically denial of death. They, he calls them immortality projects. So this is, it haunts us. Even when we do not think about it directly, we don't like to think about it directly. And here is the first line of this mantra, Amritasya Putraha, children of immortal bliss. It says that we are immortal. We are not mortal, though our bodies be mortal. And he says that this truth is not known to everybody. This is, he says, Aye dhamani divyani tastu. If there are gods in higher heavens, then you listen to this truth too, which, which I'm teaching you because you do not know about it. What is this truth? Vedaham purusham mahantam. I have realized that infinite being. There is a reality, an infinite reality. What is it like? Aditya varnam, blazing forth with the light like the sun. Not a material light like this, this light or the light like the sun also. Light of the light of awareness of consciousness, Aditya Varnam, Tamas of Parastat, forever beyond darkness, forever beyond the darkness of 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 death, of disease, of of uh, limitation, beyond all darkness, beyond the darkness of human limitation and suffering, Tamas of Parastat. I was reading this. Um, book, a mathematician's apology, Hardy, G. H. Hardy, a friend of mine who's a monk and a mathematician, had recommended it strongly. You know, Hardy is the one who who collaborated with uh, uh, Ramanujam. Yeah. Um, so, in his book, he starts off that one of the great motivations for doing mathematics is he he quotes from a beautiful poem. You know, that now on this level sand. Now on this level sand between land and between sea and land, uh, what shall I build against the falling of the night? What shall I make against the falling? Falling of the night is death. It's coming. 
So what shall I build? And it's a very evocative thing. You, whatever you're building on sand also is built in sand. It'll, it'll go away one day. Um, Tamasaf Parastad, uh, he says, against the falling of the light, there is something against the falling of the, of the night. He says, there is something beyond darkness. This, this thing which he has realized, he says, is beyond darkness, is beyond the falling of the night. There's this famous poem, um, do not go gentle into the, uh, Dylan Thomas, into the um, night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Hmm? I've forgotten the exact poem. It's, it's worth understanding what he's trying to say and what is the response of Vedanta to that, we'll see. In fact, Krishna's teaching about the Atman here is a direct response to that. Tamas of Parastat, beyond darkness, there is a reality. And what happens if you realize this reality, if you find this reality? Tameva viditva ati mrityumeti. By realizing that, one transcends death. Any other way? Can we have genetic engineering or something like that to transcend death? Nanyaf pantha vidyate ayanaya. There is no other way. There is no other way. Every way, science or medicine or entertainment, it, it, it solves our problems for a while. And one type of problem. But they are replaced by other problems. Or the same problems come back with redoubled force a little later. So, there is something which you realize which is beyond death. And if you realize that, you go beyond death. One might, if you think closely and read between the lines, if there is such a thing, and I realize it, I find it, I see it, I experience it. That is beyond death. If that is beyond death, by experiencing it, how do I go beyond death? Do you see the question? There is something, which is wonderful, that it is something extraordinary, call it God or Brahman or whatever, and it is immortal, it does not die, it's beyond suffering and death. How nice. But how does that help me? It says that by realizing that you go beyond death, it means, it can only mean one thing. Do you know what it is? That realizing that means realizing that is I. Aham Brahmasmi. That immortal reality is my reality. Since it is my reality, then I go beyond death. Did you catch that? <clears throat> that immortal reality, beyond death, is in some sense, I must be that. Otherwise, how do I go beyond death by realizing that, that reality? If I am just the body, there is some ultimate reality which is not subject to death. Fine, it's not subject to death, but I'm going to die. No, in some sense, I must be that ultimate reality. That is what we must realize. I remember meeting many, many years ago when I was a novice, the ashram where I joined, um, there was a very devoted elderly gentleman. Uh, he has passed away now, so I can just, um, I can tell his name, Badal Babu. And he used to visit a very great monk, Swami Premeshananda, who was a disciple of Holy Mother. And Swami Premeshananda, Swami Premeshananda's letters are now available, letters of Swami Premeshananda. Many of the Bengali songs which we say, sing in our main monastery, uh, they were written by Swami Premeshananda. Um, he was, even in his lifetime, acknowledged as an enlightened person, Jivan Mukta. Now this Badal Babu, in his younger days, he used to visit Swami Premeshananda regularly. And he was a very religious young man, spiritually inclined. He would visit monks and yogis and spiritual masters, and he would carry those stories back to Swami Premeshananda. And he would say, you know, Swami, I met this other Swami or this other yogi and he has done such med meditation or he has realized that or had that vision, this realization and so on. Wonderful, inspiring stories. One day, Swami Premeshananda said with a great deal of pathos, you know, feeling to, to, Badal, who, to Badal Babu who was narrating one more such story of spiritual realization by somebody. He said... My dear boy, if the whole world were to turn into Ramakrishna, everybody is Sri Ramakrishna, an incarnation of God, 
ultimately what good is it to you or me whole world they all become spiritual giants but we remain the same ultimately say at the point of death after knowing all these wonderful people and let it all be true let them all have att attained such spiritual heights but you have not attained anything i have not attained anything then what good is it to me or you in bengali he said those who understand bengali you'll, you'll catch the flavor of it he said ore badla jodi sara jagat tai ramkeshto hoye jay tate tori baki amari baki if everybody is transformed not into a yogi into sri ramakrishna into an avatar so what for me or you it's great great for them but for what about, what about us we must realize this as i am that reality and this is what sri krishna first tells the first thing he tells arjuna is there is a reality your reality which is beyond death he starts off by saying that there never was a time when you were not there or i was not there or these assembled kings and warriors were not there remember it is the kurukshetra the battlefield and there will never be a time when you will not be there when you will not exist there will never be a time when i will not exist there will never be a time when these assembled kings and warriors will not exist this is the exact the opposite of our intuitive feeling about ourselves what is our feeling about ourselves that um, there was a time when i was not there clearly before i was uh, um, i was before i was born i say before this body was born i was not there this world was there but i was not there in this world and clearly there will come a time i feel very strongly and i will not be there the world will go on but i will not be there we will not be there we feel that and here krishna says straight away just the opposite there never was a time when you were not there you were there and there will never be a time when you will not be there you will be there he uses multiple negatives yeah even there never was a time when you were not there there never will be a time when you will not be there which means yeah, nityam eternal the soul the atman is eternal in vedanta they love using philosophical logical logical language they have a term for anterior absence they call it that means absence before our birth before we were there so that is called pragabhava see a pot before it's created it was not there so there was the absence of the pot before the creation of the pot so our absence was there my absence was there before my birth it's called pragabhava and after my death there will be my absence i will not be there in this world they have a term for that it's called dhamsa bhava the abs abhava means absence dhamsa means destruction the absence after destruction you destroy the pot the pot is not there anymore so there is a absence before birth and there is an absence after birth uh, after death there is an absence after death what now they they say the way they put it is sri krishna is saying that the atman is devoid of both types of absence pragabhava dhamsa bhava rahita atma atma is devoid of the absence prior to birth devoid of absence after the death of the body the de birth and death of the body uh, are not related to the atman's presence or absence the ap atman is ever present the body was absent before its birth the body is absent after its death but not the atman not you so this is the teaching about the eternality of the atman sri krishna emphasizes it again and again and again he says then what is birth and death he minimizes its impact he says yes it is an event which you experience and which we experience but because we experience it we must be there to experience it we are not created by that experience we are not destroyed by that experience neither created by the experience of birth nor destroyed by the experience of death and he uses a very beautiful example that of um, komaram yovanam jara childhood youth and old age just as the body goes through transitions it changes tremendously and i experience the changes of what of the body where is childhood it's in the body 
The, it's, it's a body which is, is a little boy or a girl. Or a teenager. It changes so much. And then it changes into youth. You come into youth and full uh, you know, bloom of youth and health and the peak of our powers. That is change of the body. And you experience it. And the body then matures and begins to decline. And we experience it. And you say, oh boy, do we experience it. <laughs> aches here, aches there. And somebody's, you know, it, there's a story, um, old Indian story, where the, the, they say, Yamadut, the, the messengers of death, have arrived to take a person who's dying. You know, like, time to go. Your time is up. And this person says, you never gave me any warning. I've got so much to do. I mean, it's, uh, I said, we did give you a warning. Where? Didn't you see the hair thinning out and growing gray? <laughs> Didn't you see the teeth falling out? Uh, didn't you see the eyesight dimming? These are all messages from Yama, Yamaraja, from the king of death, that your time is up. First warning, second warning, third warning. G get your act together, your time to go. Uh, these transitions of the body, we experience them. And we don't give much importance to that. We go through that. And ups and downs, we, we struggle with that. But notice... There are huge differences in the body, and yet you are the same person. You say, I was in that child's body. I was the one who, who experienced the teenager's body. I was the one who experienced the young person's body. Now I experience myself in an old person's body, and so on. In the same way, just as you experience them and you take it in as, as normal and nothing extraordinary, Krishna says, the wise one is not disturbed by the birth or the death of the body. By the death, especially he says, Dehantara Prapti, by the death of the body, is not experienced, is, is not disturbed by that. In the main monastery in, in Belurbat, when um, a senior monk passes away and, and the body, we have the permission from the municipality to cremate the body ourselves, so we do that. And, what, and it's a very interesting event. And that uh, it's usually late in the night after the main monastery is closed and people have gone. And we sit throughout the night, the cremation pyre and the body is burning. And there are songs, devotional songs, and people are meditating. It's not a sad occasion. It's a, I was taught when I was a young novice that why are you sad when you see a beloved elder Swami passing away? Think about it. This person led a holy life all life long and this is a culmination of it. It's glorious. It's good. So one of the songs they sing is Maron ki bhai dakhao more. O death, what fear dost thou hold for me? What fear do you show me? I, I have no fear of you. Exactly the verse from the Gita. I was a child. I'm, um, I'm a young person now. In two days, I shall be an old person. And after that, the body shall go. And one day there will be a new birth and a new body. Death is a transition. Death is, is not um, an end or a full stop. A comma at best. Or a, or a hyphen. The Bengali words are Shishu chilam juba hoechi Dudin pare vriddha habo Deher nashe Dehantar That means at the end, at the destruction of the body, a new body is attained. What fear does death hold for me? It's a transition. That's what Krishna says. Sri Krishna. In Vedantic terms, what happens exactly is this. Vedanta, if you analyze ourselves, we have a physical body here. What is called the gross body. Sthula Sharira. And in that, we have a subtle body. Sukshma Sharira. You'll say, what proof? You don't, nobody asks for what is the proof of, of a physical body because everybody sees it, everybody feels it. It's a public fact. But what is the proof of a subtle body? Exactly like that. You experience it. Right now you're experiencing it. Thoughts, feelings, ideas, memories, desires. So this, these, all of these are parts of what is called the subtle body. And there's something more beyond that called the causal body. We will not go into that in Sanskrit. Sthula Sharira, gross body. Sukshma Sharira, subtle body. Karana Sharira, causal body. They are all bodies, that's not you. Beyond that or underneath that lies the Atman. And this is a very analytic way of looking. Analytic means dividing it analytically to understand it. 
What are we trying to understand? What happens at death? At death, it is the physical body, the gross body, which falls apart, which dies. Literally, we see it. You burn it or bury it or whatever. But Vedanta holds, in fact, I will say any religious philosophy holds, any religion in the world will say that this subtle body is the one which continues. And science cannot deny it on two counts. Why? First of all, where is the proof that the subtle body is gone? Right now, when I talk to you and you listen to me and you talk with me, I'm actually interacting not just with the physical body, I'm interacting with the person in that body. That's the feeling we get. We are not just interacting with bodies, we are interacting with a person embodied. Now when the body dies, how do you know that the person is dead? Where is the proof? There's no response, obviously, because the body is dead. If the counter is shut, then how can you talk with the, with the, with the official who is behind the counter? You can't see that person, that person can't talk with you. The counter is shut, the windows have been pulled down, the body is dead. How it would not be possible, even if that person was still there, it would not be possible for that person to communicate with you. Where is the proof that that person is gone? There's no clear indication that the person is gone. The second reason why science cannot object to this is, science has not yet given us the link between the subtle body and the physical body. The reason why doctors or why scientists would say that there is nothing left over after death is because there is a, there is a belief, I will say. There is a belief, uh, a dogma, a scientific dogma, that somehow this mind, what we call the mind and personality, they're somehow generated by the physical body. So if the physical body, the brain and the nervous system fall apart, there's no more person. So that's called materialist reductionism, and that doesn't work. Nobody has yet shown the causal link. The two are related. The subtle body and the physical body are related. So does Vedanta also says that. You don't need science to know that. Your thoughts and the body are related. If you're feeling the body is sick, you feel unwell. If you take a cup of coffee in the body, uh, your mind also feels alert. So they are related. But that one produces the other, there is no causal link. This is at the risk of repeating myself ad nauseum. It's a hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> so um, the mind is not produced by the body. The subtle body is not produced by the gross body. After death, the physical body falls apart, the sukshma sharira, the subtle body, and the causal body, they are the ones who, what we call, transmigrate. That means go from one body to another. That, by the way, is not good news. According to Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, all the Indian religions, that's actually the bad news. Because you tend to repeat this cycle again and again and again. That's the whole problem. That we are trapped in a limited existence. Continuously subject to suffering. The good news is that we don't end with the physical body. But the bad news is we repeat the whole cycle over again. That's the, the, the belief system. So this is the idea. In fact, sometimes people ask me. Um, just yesterday, I think, in the University of Michigan, we had a... a uh, a symposium yesterday and after the talk a young man asked me Swami you said that the Atman is pure consciousness without any attributes without any characteristics I am pure consciousness without any characteristics and the body has characteristics body has qualities and differences at death the body dies Atman still exists and we are reborn but then you also say that our we inherit characteristics from the past birth. You know, a very good person tends to be a good person. A very So the, the qualities from past lives are transmitted across. Now, do you see the problem there? If the body which has different characteristics is dead, and the Atman has no characteristics, so the characteristics of the past birth, how are they transmitted in the new birth? What comes to the new birth? It's a subtle body. The characteristics, the qualities which differentiate one person from another, they are in the subtle body, in the mind. And if you actually check, that's so. We experience those things as in, in the mind, the tendencies, dispositions in the mind. Those are transmitted from birth to birth. Now, going forward. 
So this is the first thing which Sri Krishna points out, the most important thing. You are the real you, the Atman is not subject to death. He puts it in another way, little later on. It is not subject to destruction. Remember the, the context is the battlefield, death and destruction. So the Atman is not subject to destruction. Avinashi, indestructible. He says that the sword cannot cut, fire cannot burn, the air cannot you know, dry up or desiccate, water cannot drown, and so on. That means the five elements. Uh, sword is made of earth. The weapons cannot cut it. So the, the Atman cannot be destroyed by material nature. It is indestructible. What happens at death? Sri Krishna gives another beautiful example, which has become very famous. Just vasamsi jirnani athavihaya. As we give up an old suit of clothes, we throw it away, and then we put on a new suit of clothes. Just like that, a worn out body is discarded, and a new body. By, by body, now you must be more careful. What body do we mean? Not all bodies are discarded, only the most outward, the physical body, the gross body, sthula sharira, gross body, physical body, that dies, it's discarded. When it wears out, when it no longer serves my purpose, I move on, that is discarded. But the other body is still remaining, the subtle body still remains. The causal body, sukshma sharira, karana sharira still remains. The atman is still limited by these bodies and as we go on to other bodies. Now, moving on to a deeper point, which Sri Krishna next raises. This example I've given earlier, it, it's worth repeating here. This question of an intrinsic property and an accidental property. An intrinsic property is something that belongs to the entity. Like fire has the power of burning. The classic example is fire and the power of burning, milk is white. So those qualities, uh, they go with, with that entity. So the power of burning goes with fire. And an accidental property is something that is gained and lost. So they give the example of a pot, a pot which is painted white. It can be repainted red or green. So the, qual the color of the pot is not uh, central. It is not intrinsic to the pot. It can change. The pot remaining the same, different colors can come and go. So incidental properties or accidental properties and intrinsic properties. Intrinsic properties last as long as the entity is, la is there. Accidental properties are gained and lost. Now, the example which I have given is heat. So a potato is being boiled. The potato is hot. Hot potato. But the heat does not belong to the potato. It is borrowed from um, the boiling water. And the water itself is not uh, hot by nature. It borrows its heat from the hot pan underneath. And the pan is also not hot by nature, intrinsically so. It is borrowing heat from the fire under it. And the fire is intrinsically hot, yes, it is. It is intrinsically hot. It is hot in itself. As long as the fire lasts, it's hot. But the pan, which is hot, was cold earlier, and eventually when the fire goes out, will be cold. The water in the pan was cold earlier, and once the heat it loses its heat, it will become cold again. The potato too, potato too also will become cold at one time, but not the, not the fire. Note then, the heat which was borrowed is lost. It's gained and lost. But the heat, which is intrinsic, is neither gained nor lost. It's not that the fire was cold at one time, then became hot. And then it will become cold again. Never. That's ridiculous. As long as the fire is burning, it's hot. What, what do I intend to prove by this? Intrinsic properties are not lost, are not gained or lost. They're always there. And extrinsic property or accidental properties are gained and lost. If a property is gained or lost, then we know that it is accidental or incidental. If a property is not lost, then we know that it is permanent, intrinsic. Uh, it belongs to that entity, uh, entity intrinsically. Now, let me ask you this question. 
if you treat existence like that. Philosophically speaking, I don't know how many of us here are trained philosophically, immediately there would be an objection because existence is not a property. But anyhow, supposing you were to treat, look at the question of existence. If an entity has existence as an accidental characteristic, what will happen to that entity? It will be destroyed. It will be born and destroyed. Gain, it will gain existence and lose existence. Gaining existence is a fancy way of saying it is born or produced or created. Losing existence is another way of saying that it will be destroyed or it will die. And if, a, if anything is there which does not, which, which has existence as its intrinsic nature, what will happen to it? It will be permanent. There will never be a time when it gains existence. It always is. There will never be a time when it loses existence. It always is. It will be permanent or eternal. Now notice that what um, Krishna just said, the soul or Atman is eternal. He just said it's immortal. It is not born, it does not die. If it is not born and if it does not die, if it is eternal, then it has existence as an intrinsic characteristic. This having existence as an intrinsic characteristic is called Sat, pure being. This is one more um, clue about the nature of the Atman. One is that it is eternal. The second one, if you ask what is it actually, if it is not the body, if it is not the mind, then what is it? What's the nature? What's, what's the material? What you say? It is pure being or sat. Existence itself. Atman is existence itself. Now this leads to a very interesting conclusion. If the soul or the Atman is existence, if your nature is existence itself, if it is sat, then something other than you, follow this carefully, this is very subtle, sounds very metaphysical, very simple also, but very profound. Something other than you, something which is different from you, which is not the Atman. Different from the self, not self. Different from Atman in Sanskrit, Anatma, not Atma. Atma is existence itself, pure being. Then Anatma, not self, will be not being, not existence. Let me repeat again. If you are existence, and some, then something apart from you will be Non-existence. Correct. It will, you are existence itself. How did we come to that? Because you never go out of existence. You never come into existence, never go out of existence. That's what Sri Krishna is saying. If that is true, in that case, you are existence itself. Something other than you, something other than the self, will be of the nature of non-existence. And this is what Krishna says in the 16th verse. Maybe one of the most profound verses of the entire Bhagavad Gita. He says, Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha. That which is the Atman, it is pure being, it never goes out of existence, it's always there. And that which is not the Atman, which is not you, it's not being itself, it never exists also, never comes into existence. You, the Atman, you never go out of existence. And that which is not you, something other than the real you, never comes into existence. Now that's an incredible statement. You know what it means? Atma Satyam Jagat Mithya. You, the self, the pure being, you are the reality, your real nature, not the person. And everything apart from you, whatever you think is not me, is actually an appearance. It is not real. If it, does not come, if it does not come into existence and yet we experience it, how is it possible? Something does not come into existence and yet we experience it. We are experiencing it as another, it borrows existence from you. Just like the potato or the boiling water or the pan has borrowed heat from the fire underneath. Similarly, this world of names and forms, it borrows existence from the Atman or Brahman from pure being, and thus appears to have an existence. It appears to have an existence. This appearing to have an existence apart from you, 
we we don't feel that these things we don't feel that these things have independent uh, these things are borrowing existence from us we don't feel that we feel i exist and this body and the chair i'm sitting on that also exists and we exist separately this is um this is illusion this is not real what is real is i am awareness i am pure being and the whatever i experience in awareness whatever i see to be an object of awareness is nothing really apart from me the pure being it appears in me i experience it as if it's another but it's not nothing other than me it's i alone with a different name and form appearing in that form and i experience it as an other as not self but the not self has no existence apart from the self sri krishna says na sato vidyate bhava the not self um appearances have no intrinsic existence of themselves and you the self you have intrinsic existence and these two drishta uh, antah those who realize these two very clearly the nature of the self i am brahman the reality and the nature of the not self this is an appearance it's nothing apart from my own internal nature my my real nature they have realized the truth tattva darshi they have realized the truth now we have come to two important conclusions the first one we started off with atma nitya eternal avinashi indestructible you are eternal and indestructible anatma the not self non eternal destructible subject to birth and death second not only are you eternal and indestructible you are the only reality that there is atma satyam and not self the what we see as other mithya an appearance an appearance of what the snake is an appearance of what the rope It's, there must be something for it to appear it can't be nothing it is an appearance of nothing other than that atman that purusham mahantam which swami vivekananda speaks of that infinite being it appears as the not self and experiences itself in that way this is the second great thing atma satya jagat mithya or in vedantic terms brahma satyam jagat mithya jagat mithya means nothing other than you can equally say everything in the jagat is brahman jagat mithya and everything is brahman is exactly the same thing swami virajananda ji used to say the entire world including this body and mind are presented to me to me means the awareness at the same time so either i am all of it or none of it both of these will release you will give you moksha freedom right now both of these attitudes i am none of it they are movies in my awareness in i the awareness or i am all of it what is bondage what is samsara is i am only this one and you and everything else are separate from me i am a tiny creature in a vast and indifferent world different from me i play my part and i'm gone though i may rage against the dying of the light the light is going to die it's only because i'm looking at the surface of the light in the in the heart of reality i am the source of the light i am the light i can never die this is the second great conclusion atma satyam jagat mithya moving on further krishna says in the next verse 17th verse avinashi to tad vidhi yena sarvam idam tatam a very beautiful conclusion this indestructible absolute reality sat the atman is all pervasive it follows immediately then what are all these things they are none other than you atman is all pervading our intuitive feeling about ourselves is i am here i'm not all pervading i'm not there i'm not here uh, anywhere else how can i be all pervading i'm just here sri krishna says the atman is all pervading everything that you experience and do not experience everything is pervaded by you it sounds counterintuitive completely but a simple example will show what what is meant 
Imagine your dreams. Now, don't go into a dream state. <laughs> Imagine w some, some vivid dream that you had. When you look back upon the dream from the waking state, what do you realize? That in the dream, that entire place, the roads and the trees and the sky and the lakes and rivers, I was all of that. Do you see what I mean by that? I was all of that means all of those things, they were all imagined in my mind. All of those things were the dreamer's mind. All the people, not just I, I was there in my own dream. But other than me, there were so many other people and plants and animals and all of those were nothing other than me. It was the dreamer's mind alone which became all of that. Can I say then, all the people, all the events, the time, the, the very time and space of the dream world were pervaded by me, the dreamer. Can I say that? Can we all say that? Yes. What is true? Now take one step into Advaita, into Vedanta. What is true of the dream world and the dreamer's mind? One is the dream world and the dreamer's mind. And remember, we have agreed that the dreamer's mind pervades the dream world. The same thing is true of consciousness and its objects. Hmm? All that we have in life is consciousness and its objects. True or not? Whatever you have in life. There's nothing other than that. That's your life. Consciousness and its objects. What is true of the dreamer's mind and the world of the dreams is exactly true of consciousness and the objects of consciousness. Avinashi tu tad vidhi yena sarvam idam tatam. Know that indestructible, that to be indestructible by which everything here is pervaded. Here means which is an object to your senses. What you see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Not only to senses, object to the mind. What you remember, imagine, think, desire, love, hate. All of that is pervaded by you, the awareness. It is given existence, temporary existence, by you, the awareness. By you, the pure being. By you, which is chit and sat. Awareness and consciousness. It's very simple, really. First, we, without, when we do not think about it, we just behave like bodies and minds. I have thoughts and feelings and desires, and here I am, this body. As we go into Vedanta, our first awakening is, oh, I am awareness, I am consciousness, in which I experience body and mind and the world. Are you with me so far? Can we think about ourselves as I am awareness and in which I am experiencing body, mind and world? So that's the first thing. Then we notice that the body changes, the world changes, the body changes, our perceptions change, thoughts change, ideas change, feelings change, knowledge changes. But the awareness in itself does not change. Awareness is like a steady light. Unchanging awareness. Are you with me there also? Do you at least get the... The, the trend of thought. Awareness does not change. All changes are noted in awareness, recognized in awareness, lit up by awareness. Now this unchanging awareness is what Krishna calls the indestructible Atman. If it is unchanging awareness, if it is indestructible, not subject to birth and death, then existence is an intrinsic characteristic of this awareness. If existence is an, you see the logic, if existence is an intrinsic characteristic of this awareness, then anything apart from this awareness is an appearance, does not have ex intrinsic existence. It borrows existence from awareness, just as everything in your dream borrows existence from you, the dreamer. You are sat chit, pure being, pure awareness, pervading everything that you experience. So the third thing that we learn about the Atman, Sarva Vyapi, um, Sarva Vyapi, all pervading, all pervading. I have told you earlier about this uh, in, in the Himalayas, when this is being taught, a monk at the back, he suddenly raises his hand and he asks the teacher, who's another senior monk, a teacher? 
He said, just a minute. How can you say that I am all-pervading? I am here and not there. And how can I be all-pervading? I am just here and not even there. And how can I be all-pervading? In Hindi, I am not here and not there. So, how can I be I am here, I am not there. How can I be all pervading? And you know what the answer was? The teacher said, Ah, but here and there, are they not both in your awareness? The moment I say, I am here and not there, I am speaking as what? The body. Can you not say exactly the same thing in your dreams? Somebody comes in your dreams and says, You are everything here. I say, What silliness? I'm here, I'm not even there. When you wake up, who would be right? That person would be right. Because everything in your dream was in your mind. Similarly, everything that we experience is in fact, literally in our, our awareness. You as awareness pervade everything. That's the third point I wanted to make. Not me, Krishna wants to make in the Bhagavad Gita that awareness, Atman, is all pervading. The question is, all-pervading, indestructible, nothing other than that exists. But now one may ask a practical question. Where is it? We don't experience it. I experience people and events and space and time and my own body, my own thoughts and perceptions. Where is this precious Atman you're talking about? So Krishna says, he anticipates the question and he uses the word aprameyaha. Aprameyaha means it's a very technical word. It's not an object to the instruments of knowledge. What does it mean? Instruments of knowledge? How do you know anything? We, we deploy instruments of knowledge. Like scientists using telescopes and microscopes, we deploy instruments of knowledge. I, the awareness, to know the objects of awareness, I deploy sight. I can see forms. I deploy ears. I can hear sounds. Touch, taste, smell, all of these instruments are deploy. But the Atman has neither form, nor sound, nor taste, nor touch, nor smell. Nor smell. So the five sense organs cannot objectify the Atman. I use my mind, if it's something I cannot see or hear or smell or taste, I use my mind to conceive of it, think of it, ideate, you know, to, to intellectualize it. But the Atman is not an object of the mind either. Beyond mind, beyond senses. This is called Aprameyaha. You might say, wait a minute. If it's beyond mind and senses, what right do you have to say such a thing exists? To say something exists, it must become an object of knowledge. True or not? Otherwise you can imagine anything. Suppose I say Harry Potter exists. You will say, how do you know? I say, I read about it in the book. So that's a book, it's, a, it's in the fiction section in, in Barnes and Nobles. But do you know what that means? It means it's fiction. It's, it does not exist in this world. So there must be some, some object, some instrument of knowledge which objectifies the entity to make us claim that it exists in this world. And if the Atman is not an object to any instrument of knowledge, what right do you have to say that it exists? That question might come. And so the answer, Krishna does not make it explicit there. It is consciousness, Swaprakasha. Swaprakasha means self-luminous. Here is a clue to the nature of the Atman. It is not an object of the senses or of any instrument of knowledge. Rather, it is the subject. It's not... It is that which lights up all the instruments and enables you to, instrument, uh, to, to use those instruments. It's like looking for, and somebody sees a picture, the very picture, the photograph means there's a photographer. Where? I can't see the photographer in the picture. Nowadays you can with a selfie. But in those days you could not. A portrait with a lot of people and there's one person missing there. Photographer. Uh, but how do you know that there was a photographer? Because there is the photograph. Exactly in the same way, how do you know that there is consciousness? I can't see consciousness as an object. I can't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Well, to hear, smell, taste, touch, anything, to think, 
to remember, to love, to hate, even to doubt that there is consciousness. You have to be conscious. Shankaracharya says, it is the very self of the one who doubts that there is such a self. Without that you could not doubt. Who is the one doubting? What is the one doubting? If you say everything is a dream, it means there is one thing which is not a dream. What is that? The dreamer, exactly. There must be something beyond the dream to dream the dream. To experience all of this, there must be an experiencer, which is not part of these things. So, aprameya points to the fact that why you cannot experience it through the sense organs or the mind, but it also points to where you can find the self. Beyond the sense organs, beyond the mind, you are that consciousness which shining through the mind and the sense organs, you experience the world and this body and mind. Aprameya, it's not an object of the, of the pramanas, instruments of knowledge. Goes further. One more point and then I'm done. It is akarta abhokta. Akarta abhokta, very interesting point. Sri Krishna says that um, nahanti nahanyate, it neither kills, the Atman never, neither kills nor is slain. Remember the context was the Kurukshetra battle, the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So that's why the language is slayer or slain. But the philosophical import of this, the philosophical meaning of this is, it's neither a doer nor an experiencer. Consciousness by itself is not a doer. It's not an agent of action. Consciousness associated with the body and mind, associated with this body and mind, becomes the doer of actions. Consciousness associated with the body and mind, the sense organs, becomes the experiencer of a world. But without a body and mind in itself, it's neither a doer nor an experiencer. In Sanskrit, akarta abhokta. But the way Krishna puts it in the Gita is, it neither slays nor is slain. And Emerson, you know, uh, his famous poem, Brahma, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he wrote a poem called Brahma. If you Google it, you'll find it. It's a very well-known poem. And it's a direct translation of, I think, the 19th verse of the Bhagavad Gita. If the red slayer thinks he slays, or the slain think he is slain, neither know the subtle ways. I, 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 I come, I keep, I pass, and I return. I keep means I, I am here. I pass means I die. And return means I again come back. That is the subtle body, of course. But beyond that is the Atman. He says if this red slayer, why red slayer? Because it's a warrior. He's referring to Gita, Bhagavad Gita. So uh, nowadays there's these, what do they call? Cliff notes or something, study notes. So there's a study note to Brahma, which says here um, Emerson is referring to the Vedantic text Gita. And <laughs> so he had a wonderful collection of in, uh, Hindu philosophical texts, 45 books in those days. Um, Red slayer thinks he slays, or if the slain think he is slain, neither know the subtle ways. Uh, so uh, you're not the doer of deeds, nor the experiencer of the results as Atman. But as limited by body and mind, with the subtle body, you become the doer of deeds and the experience of Atman, uh, of the results. The deeper meaning is this. A fundamental idea in all Indic religious systems is karma. Action and its results. Cause and effect. Co consequences. Causes have consequences. Actions have consequences. Cause and effect. Do good, the result will be pleasant. Do, do uh, you be consciously naughty, the result will be unpleasant. So this is basically oversimplified version of the law of karma. Now, as Swami Vivekananda put it, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the, the law. But whosoever wears a form, remember here, consciousness limited by body-mind, whosoever wears a form, wears the chain too. What is the chain? Law of karma. Whatever we have set in motion in births past will have their consequences in this birth. Whatever we set in motion now will have consequences further on. What does Vedanta offer in this chain of karma? Because Vivekananda says none escape the law. 
He says, but far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. No, thou art that, Sanyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. This Atman, this pure consciousness, which Krishna is talking about, is ever free and that is what you are. When, you realize, when we realize ourselves as that, we realize ourselves as the non-doer. One verse in the Bhagavad Gita, which Krishna rep repeats three times, the same idea, that we are actually the non-doer, we are the non-doing pure consciousness. Not that he's asking you not to do anything. Imagine, the Gita is very interesting. He says you are the non-acting pure, uh, pure consciousness. And then he urges Arjuna into action. Knowing yourself to be that non-doing pure consciousness, with body and mind, engage in action. Yeah, with a purified mind and body, engage in action, which is for the welfare of the world, which is a worship of the Lord. So, akatta abhokta, non-doing. When you realize yourself as that, far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. Three times Sri Krishna repeats this. 13th chapter he says, Prakritya karmani kriyamanani sarvasha yapashyati tathatmanam akattaram sapashyati. Prakriti alone does everything. Prakriti means nature. Alone does everything in this world, including this body, including this mind, including all the actions done by body and mind. One who realizes that, then realizes that I am the non-doing pure consciousness. Akatta. Akatta means not agent. You realize that is the true nature of ourselves. But don't get confused. He's not telling you to sit quietly. Oh, I have realized that I'm the non-doer, so I will not do anything. With body and mind, Krishna points out again and again. With body and mind, you cannot but act. Action will continue. You cannot stop acting with the body and mind. Body and mind will keep doing. You are the witness consciousness. Keep acting with body and mind. Do what is to be done. Then you are free of the bondage of karma. A devotee, one who is on the path of bhakti, instead of taking this path, this is the path of sankhya or jnana. Devotee on the path of bhakti will say, I devote all my actions to the Lord. By the grace of the Lord alone, I have this body. By the grace of the Lord alone, I have these senses and the mind. And so all that is the Lord's, I offer back unto the Lord. It's the same idea. Basically the same idea. But it's with devotion and love and it's, it's much more appealing sometimes uh, to the heart of the devotee. All right, we could go on and on. The Gita is 18 chapters long, but um, this is the core idea. The one takeaway from this is this Atman I am. What Atman? Summing up, immortal, nitya, avinashi. I do not, I'm not born with the birth of the body. I do not die with the death of the body. Who is born with the birth of the body? The subtle body gets embodied in a physical body. Who experiences death? The subtle body experiences death with the death of the physical body. But I am not born with the body. I do not die with the body. I am indestructible. That's number one. Number two, that I am the reality of this universe. Everything apart from me, the Atman, is an appearance. Atma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. Third, this Atman, the real nature, the Paramarthic, the absolute nature of the Atman, this pervades this entire world of appearance. Just as the dreamer's mind pervades the entirety of your dream world, you, the consciousness, you, pure being, you pervade this world. Pervade means this world borrows its existence from you. Remember, intrinsic property and uh, extrinsic or accidental property. Third, so that's the third thing. You pervade everything. Sounds philosophical. Practi there are tremendous practical implications. Everyone you meet is fundamentally you yourself. The good and the bad and the ugly. Every experience in your life, good and bad, whatever it is, is you only. There's nothing apart from you. Whom will you criticize? Whom will you hate? When the Atman is but one, you are but one. Then whom to hate, whom to criticize, whom to praise? All pervading, this is the meaning. The fourth one is a very philosophical but very important meaning. 
it is not an object of the senses. Aprameya. Not an object of the mind. It's not a thing. The Atman is not a thing out there. It's, follow this carefully, it's not even a thing in here. In here and out there, both of them are appearing in you, the Atman. Atman is not an object. Don't try to objectify it. You are it. And by your light, everything is lit up. You shining, all else shines after you. Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam. That shining, everything else shines. Tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light, by your light, everything here is lit up. It's not poetry. It's a literal reporting of the truth. The world outside, good and bad, the mind inside, calm and restless, they're all lit up by you, the unchanging consciousness. What else are you other than that? And finally, you are akarta bhokta, the real you. You are not the doer, nor the experiencer of the results of actions. You are forever free of karma. Karma is regarded as, as the bondage which traps us in samsara. But you are forever, you already are free of, of karma. You have to recognize that. You have to own it up. You have to say, I am that one which is forever free of karma. Whatever happens on the screen, whatever the plot of the movie, the screen is free of the plot. Tragedy or comedy, the screen is free of it. Not only free of it, it's the screen which enables the tragedy or the comedy to happen. Right? You are the Atman, free of samsara, but because of you samsara is happening. Look at the, <laughs> the wonderful nature of this thing. All right. So these are the five things about the Atman which we should think about. Take it seriously. This is the essence of the teaching of Vedanta and I would say in a general sense of all spirituality in the world. It's, a, it's the saving knowledge. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda. May this Atma Jnana, this knowledge of the Atman, the realization of the Atman, it's realization, not just knowing about it, may dawn upon us in this very life. Swami Vivekananda, he said the essence of religion, each soul is potentially divine. Each soul is potentially divine means we are that Atman already. But why potential? He says because we have not manifested it or realized it yet. The goal of life is to realize this divinity within and to manifest it in our daily lives. Manifest it means live it. Not just listen to a nice lecture, not just feel, oh, I'm cool, I'm the Atman. <laughs> and then lose your temper at every little uh, irritation, be upset uh, because things do not go the way this particular little creature wants it to go. No. Manifesting it means literally becoming a saint in your day-to-day -day life. Don't try to be a saint. Try to know yourself as the Atman, you will see low and behold you have become a saint. <laughs> you may not have, you might not be a card-carrying saint, but saint so and so, <laughs> but yeah, that's what your life, you'll be transformed. Our lives will be transformed and very quickly. If you struggle to to gather and cultivate the qualities of a saint, it's a lifelong struggle and pretty difficult and dull and dreary. If you own up to this insight that I am this Atman, you will see immediately a change in the thought, in the emotions, the way you think and feel, and the way you deal with people and events in your life. You see, a lot of peace will come. A great release will come upon you. The more we think about this, a great lightness comes upon us. Fear of death diminishes. I won't say disappears, it diminishes. It, disip it becomes diminished. Uh, the, the horrid reality of, of our world oppressing us, it, it becomes shimmery because it's not real apart from you. You feel free of the bondage of karma. You realize yourself as light, as pure awareness right now. I pray to them that this may become a reality in our lives. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu